The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. I will go ahead and give a short introduction. This is Josh Hunsinger with the Placer County Agriculture Department. I am the uh, the uh, Placer County Agricultural Commissioner and Sealer of Weights and Measures. I'm also the uh, chair of the CACASA uh, Personnel Standards Committee. I want to welcome everybody to this webinar. This is, is the first of what will be five webinars that we are planning to do to help prepare folks for the uh, oral uh, deputy and commissioner or sealer exams. And um, so really uh, looking forward to each of these. They will each be done by uh, some of the subject matter experts who uh, from either the state agencies or from the commissioner's association who can uh, are really experts on each of these topics. Uh, the purpose is not to spoon feed information, but rather to give some of the core principles um, that you need to know to pass these exams and to be a deputy or a commissioner or a sealer. And so um, really looking forward to these. Uh, they will be recorded and posted to the CACASA and the uh, hopefully the CDFA websites so you can go back and review them or if someone was unable to participate today or at one of the other sessions they can go back and review that information um, on their own time. Um, today's presentation will be on some of the common mistakes that are made typically during the uh, oral exams and then also the oral exam process itself. So I am going to be uh, turning this presentation over to Gary Leslie, who's our CDFA CACASA liaison, and Joey Marotti, who is our DPR CACASA liaison. So with that, let me um, pull up the um, presentation for, uh, for, uh, today and um, turn it over to Gary and Leslie. So one second, there we go. So Gary, you should have uh, control of the screen and hopefully everybody can see the um, my screen and take it away, Gary and Joey. All right, Josh, well thank you very much and uh, thank you for putting this effort together. I think it'll it would be very beneficial to candidates taking these exams. So I just want to um, again, express my appreciation to Kakasa and you particularly, Josh. Um, as Josh said, we're, we're going to go over um, the licensing exams a little bit today, some of the process, uh, some of the feedback that we've gotten from commissioners that have uh, participated in exams with us. So you know this just isn't coming from us and, and some suggestions on on how candidates in general may be able to uh, improve their exam techniques. And then we're going to uh, go over some of the uh, study references that are out there available to you to be able to prepare for these exams. With that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, just a little background on, on exams in, in general. You know, well, why are these licenses required? I get asked that all the time. And the legislature and its uh, wisdom back in the early 19th century actually um, because of the importance of agriculture and trade to California's economy um, deemed it necessary that county staff who were enforcing state programs should be licensed and the primary reasons for that were to ensure that the staff were well qualified of course and to maintain a consistency in, in statewide programs. Um, the exams, as you know them today, are there's uh, I think all of you probably know there's eight uh, inspector bio or biologist exams that need to be um, completed before you're qualified to be a deputy, and then um, on the weights and measures there's of course a deputy exam, and on the ag side there's a deputy exam, and once you complete that, then you're qualified to take the commissioner or or sealer exam. Um, the Lower level exams all consist of multiple choice questions, and those are pretty much just to test the candidate's general knowledge of job proficiencies in whatever uh, license you're applying for. At the deputy level, we also have a we have a written multiple choice exam, and then we add in the essay questions. So 
if you're taking a deputy exam, be prepared to answer three or four essay questions that you will need to write out uh, longhand, and those are just kind of to test your writing skills and, and make sure you're proficient in that area. Um, once you've completed successfully the uh, written exams, um, of course, at the deputy and, and the CRM commissioner level, then you're required to um, appear before an interview panel and successfully complete an oral interview. So the oral interview, and, and this presentation Joey and I are giving today may be a review for a lot of you that uh, um, are members of KSAP, so it's going to be very similar to the information we presented there. So for those that you go to our, the KSAP conference, this will be a review, but we want to make sure we were able to get this information out to those of you that not, may not be able to attend those conferences as well. So just getting back on this. Um, the oral interview, so what, what do you expect when you get there? Well, you apply and you know, the time comes when you're going to uh, take your interview. Um, when you arrive at the exam location, you'll be greeted by a receptionist. And his or her duties are to check the candidates in, maintain the exam uh, schedule, escort candidates to and from the preparation room, and time the, the preparation um, of the candidates. They also assist in ensuring fairness throughout the exam process. Um, as I mentioned just a minute ago, um, preparation time. Um, typically for all of our oral interviews, they consist of a small number of questions, usually four or five at this point. Um, and candidates are given those questions ahead of time and allowed to go into a quiet room where they get 30 minutes to um, make notes and prepare answers or responses for those questions. Um, while in the room, um, candidates cannot have any cell phones, purses, or other outside material with them. So if you're arriving for an exam, don't be surprised if you have other material with you. If you're asked to go, um, put that back in the car. Um, once your preparation time is up, uh, you'll be escorted into the panel room. And the panel typically consists of three members, and that'll be a CDFA representative, which is uh, typically your liaison, me, and uh, DPR representative, which is Joey Murati, who you'll get to talk to in a minute. And then we typically have a county agricultural commissioner that is out of the area that, or from out of the area that we're testing on the panel as well. So there's three panel members. Um, once the exam starts, the, the panel chair will you know, read you the ground rules of the exam and, and give you a little bit more information about the exam process, and then the exam will begin. Uh, the interview time lasts typically 30 minutes. Um, throughout the interview, um, the panel will have limited interaction with you. Um, typically, we don't ask for ask questions unless a, uh, a candidate maybe has missed an entire chunk of a of a question, in which case we might go back and ask you, you know, would you like to address this portion of the question? Or if you put an idea out there and a panelist needs more information or not to um, be sure that you have the information um, to qualify on that question, we may ask you, can you expound on that or tell us what you mean by that? But we're not going to typically lead candidates to answers um, or proceed in the line of questioning that has nothing to do with the information that's already out there, I guess. So that being said, we'll talk about the interviewing process. And, uh, and one important thing to keep in mind um, in these interviews, these are completely different than a hiring interview. A hiring interview where you're going before a, a supervisor or a board or, or, or whomever to um, compete for a position is different than a licensing interview. Um, hiring interview, the, the goal of that interviewer is to find the best position, person for that position that they're interviewing for. They're competitive. You're competing with other candidates. Um, questions may be personalized. All candidates may not get the same line of questioning in a hiring interview. And hiring interviews also, you know, highly consider your uh, personal attributes, your work experience, 
um, and uh, education, things of that sort of qualifications. Uh, qualifications. A licensing interview, the goal of the licensing panel is to ensure candidates have a knowledge and proficiencies necessary to succeed in the position. You're not competitive. You're not competing with the person before you or after you. All you're doing is um, trying to demonstrate to the panel, panel that you have enough knowledge um, required to have that license. They're standardized questions typically, always. Um, all um, licensees or licensed candidates get the same set of questions. And we're not at that point considering your personal experience or, or your job or education. Those are just things to keep in mind when approaching the exam, I guess. So that being said, what are we looking for? Um, one of the things we're looking for the ability to answer the question from the perspective of the position you're testing for. And by that I mean if you're testing for a commissioner license, you should answer as if you are a commissioner. If you are uh, testing for a deputy license, you should be answering from the perspective of a, a supervisor or a um, program head. Uh, we're testing for the general knowledge of the subject matter. So at this level, we're probably not going to be real interested in nuts and bolts of a particular program. We're not going to ask you, you know, what particular section of the uh, ag code or business and professional code is covered by that, or we're not going to ask you the genus and species of insect. We want to know your general knowledge of of the um, license area that we're testing for and your thought process in, in solving problems, I guess, is the uh, next one there. Appropriately assess problems and arrive at logical conclusions. And then we're always looking for the ability to present answers in a concise and logical manner. Um, it's difficult sometimes when candidates get flustered in there and what answers come out in little pieces and they're, they're not very well um, logically thought out or at least not presented in that manner. So it's much more or much easier for the panel to arrive at the conclusion that you're qualified for a particular question if you can uh, present the answer from start to finish. <clears throat> so some things to do. And these are very general, but be prompt, um, and by that I mean just arrive at least a few minutes before your exam is scheduled to start. Um, don't add additional stress to an already stressful situation for yourself by getting there at the last minute. Um, and this one, the next one's easier said than done, but relax as much as possible. Just make it as much like a conversation you would have with a friend or a family member or, or anything else, uh, a relaxing situation as opposed to this intimidating oral panel. You know, keep in mind, we're on your side. We really do want you to pass these exams, and we're trying to give you every opportunity to do that. Um, third one, read and reread and understand the question. Um, so many times candidates will give us a wonderful answer to a question, but it's not the question that's being asked. So make sure you read the question, reread it, and make sure you understand it. Um, and I think this will come up a little later, but the, one of the later bullets down there is take cues from the panel. If the panel hasn't marked anything down or written anything down for the last five minutes, you're probably off on a tangent and you know, either you fully answered the question already and there's nothing left to write down or you're off on a tangent. You know, usually know which one that is. Uh, use your time wisely. Now, if there's four questions on the exam and you've got 30 minutes to answer those, that gives you six, seven minutes to answer each question. So usually there's a clock in the room. Be aware of how much time you've spent on one question. Um, so many times a candidate will spend 15 minutes on, on one question and then have to cram the other three into the last 15. So we don't, we don't want to see you do that, but conversely, we're not going to stop you. If you want to spend 20 minutes on one question, we'll let you do that. Uh, put on the proper hat, and I talked about this on a previous slide. Make sure you're answering from the perspective of the of the position that you're testing for. Can't stress that enough. So many times, candidates will give us a wonderful answer, but it's at the biologist level, a 
and that's not what we're looking for in these exams. Answer questions from a statewide perspective. So keep in mind that this license of love, or qualifies you to work in any county in the state. And so many times we get answers that we don't do that in our county, or we don't do this um, particular activity, or I don't have any experience in that. So when studying for these and presenting your answers, make sure that you realize this is a, from a statewide perspective. You should be able to answer from something that's happening in any county. Hey, Gary. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, Josh. Just to jump back to your put on the proper hat, uh, comment. I wanted to just add there that one of the things I've observed is that when you're asked a question on, say, the deputy agricultural commissioner exam, using a weights and measures example is not a real appropriate um, thing to do either. You should use an ag example if you're taking an ag exam. Don't use a weights and measures example on an ag exam. Exactly. I think that's one of the comments that Joey has when we get to the Ag Commissioner comments later in the presentation. But uh, Okay, I may be jumping ahead. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. Yes, yeah, that's a very good Good point. comment. <laughs> Let's see. Be confident. You know, state your answers as confidently as you can. Um, I, I don't know how else to put with that. But always give it your best shot. You know, you may not know all the details about an answer, but at least tell us what you know about it. And, uh, do your best on it. Um, it's, it's frustrating sometimes when uh, somebody will do really good on two questions and they don't even try on the other two. And you know, Had they just been able to give us enough information on, on one more of them, they might have got a license. Oops, I think they went too far. So some things not to do. Don't ramble. Um, I guess that goes back to being concise. You know, give the answers in a, in a concise manner. And don't just ramble, hoping something will stick on the wall out there. If you really don't have any more information about a subject, it's probably best just to stop at that point and, and move on to the next question. Um, don't apologize. You know, we're all getting paid one way or another for your time there. So don't apologize to the panel for for not knowing an answer or anything like that. It, it, uh, yeah. You don't take it personally if you don't know an answer. There's no reason to apologize. Uh, don't complain or make excuses. Um, sometimes candidates will come in and they'll start complaining about the exam or the exam process or perhaps the questions even before they've got out of the room. You know, there is an appeal process that can take place after the exam's giving, but during the exam interview is not the time to voice your opinion about that. Uh, don't sell yourself short. You know, come in there and give it your best shot. And like I said earlier, use as much confidence as you can. And don't add extraneous information. That's usually just a time waster. I know in the past years there's been times where um, candidates were actually asked to provide a, a conclusion statement which they might be able to um, talk about their qualifications or, or some of their philosophies about supervision or, or program management. That's not something we're doing currently. It's not, unless the panel asks you for that information, it's just it, it uh, takes up some of your time that you could probably be spending on a, on a question developing a better answer. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Joey. And what we did is we pulled some of the commissioners that helped us with exams in the last two cycles and asked them for some some feedback on what common things that they saw. And so uh, I'll, I'll turn that over to Joey, and he's going to kind of summarize these for you. And uh, go ahead, Joey. Hey, thank you. Hi, everyone. Like Gary mentioned, uh, when uh, Josh invited us to participate in, in this webinar, I thought it'd be great to have a the commissioner's perspective. So we went ahead and requested them to maybe share some of their positives and negatives that they thought while they were serving on the panel. Uh, we received quite a few comments from over from 12 commissioners. And what I did was I went ahead and we went ahead and summarized these. And so there's eight different types of summary questions. The first one's like in the opening. Um, first one was it's just how people I want to tell you how people can be successful in the oral exam process. Um, 
and I'm just going to read these different suggestions and comments here. Uh, confidence demonstrated in the initial presentation will set a good tone for your panel and for the rest of your exam. And uh, it's normal and understandable that applicants are going to be nervous. Nerves can easily be outweighed with confidence and good answers. It's important to make eye contact with each of your panelists. Smile and be comfortable because the, the panel wants you to be successful. Uh, it's been observed that successful candidates tend to be more relaxed in their interviews. We know everyone's a bit nervous in this situation, but managing stress is actually part of this test. And again, we want you to know that we do want you to be successful. Now, there was a negative here. Um, I, I thought we could share it with you too, though. Um, some commissioners get irritated when candidates get to the exam and then decline to even try. Uh, they feel like you've spent the money and the time studying and they've even given you time off of work. Uh, and, and, and the state, basically the interview panel themselves have also given time out of their day to be there as well. So it's felt by some commissioners that you should give it your best try, but if you think you're not going to do it, give proper notice and uh, withdraw for participation until the next time. Um, when it comes to preparation, I just wanted to note that more tell the detail to come on this, there is going to be, um, and it has been, a new improved study lesson. We'll, carry, we'll cover that later in our presentation. Um, with preparation, nothing works better than good preparation when it comes to doing well on a test. Uh, it was noticed that individuals who rated pa as passing took their time to study, prepare, and practice. The likelihood of passing these exams without ad adequate preparation is very remote. Having knowledge of the material will also help portray confidence of yourself during these examinations. Uh, we were told that uh, you should brush up on things that are outside of your comfort zone. Find people that are there to support and give you information so you can learn from them. It's, uh, it was encouraged for you to use KSAP or to study with others. Some misstated information also laid in the study process and your, these resources could help you uh, catch up on that information as well. Uh, when it comes to preparation, uh, first and foremost, try to be calm. Practice giving presentations to your coworkers, friends, kids, or even your spouse. Having to stand up in front of strangers and present topics is no easy feat, but the more you practice, the better you will become and the less nervous you will be. Um, when it comes to preparation and studying, uh, they suggest using flashcards, iPads, notes, work groups, topic experts, whatever it takes to become familiar with the topics. Some people have a hard time studying for weights and measures, and, and that's because that was not their side of, of their work. They were in the pesticide use programs. So when it came to the, uh, getting familiar with weights and measures, they went and did weights and measures inspections. They asked their boss or their supervisors if they could work with those people and find the time so they could understand that. And they felt like that really helped them when they were preparing for their exams. Here's some uh, tips on answering questions. Um, we're going to talk later about some, some of the types of questions, but one of them is a process type question. It says, learn a process in dealing with any issue and then plug it in the issue and work, talk your way through it. Stop talking once you're done with your points. Don't over-communicate those points. When people had problems answering questions, basically they didn't know the basics of the constructions or implementations of new programs, what's required to make those programs work, such as budgets, authority, personnel, and training needs. Those are real important things to understand. Uh, other times people had problems answering questions when they weren't familiar with current and recent legislation. When answering questions, pay attention to what you're being asked and respond accordingly. Some candidates will give you a nuts and bolts answer, here's what we do, instead of answering or responding as if they're the person who's going to be uh, for that hat they're wearing. So basically, uh, the license that you're seeking, you want to wear that hat when you're answering the question. When answering questions, realize that laws and regulations are not the same, know the purpose of each. Know how each are created and established, and but while they are related, they are also different. To understand how they complement each other. Uh, one of the answer, when answering questions, one has observed that candidates use answer their question with an inappropriate example, such as when you're taking the deputy act exam, don't use a weights and measures example to answer that question. Um, uh, this is part of what I think, but it's very very common. 
Be sure to read and understand each question. Successful candidates are able to understand what's being asked and are able to articulate a clear and concise answer. And emphasize concise. Thank you. Following up, answer the question completely and concisely. Try not to use too much detail. In fact, that detail can sometimes can detract from your answer and confuse the panel. Don't try to bluff your way through an answer. Uh, when answering questions, candidates sometimes don't think their issues through, especially like with what the fee authority sunsets are, if they're not renewed, those type of things. What are the implications? Understand what the implications are. That's important too. As a panel member, some of the commissioners were frustrated to hear an answer, but it, that was almost good enough, but not enough to pass the question. That's where you have to know your information. There's some very good suggestions here when answering questions. You have 30 minutes to review the questions before the oral exam. Take the time to map out your answers to each question. When answering questions, don't give up if you can't complete the answer to one of the questions. Note the points that you do know and cover as much as you can. Um, answering questions, uh, let's see. How Questions starting with how would you or about a process, the steps you need to take to do something. If you haven't worked in a particular program and it's a process related question, think about a program that you do work in and try to think through those steps and relate it to the question. Maybe that will help you be successful enough to answer the question in hand. We're getting there, folks. I have a few more. When it comes to preparations, uh, the number one item is the lack of, uh, that frustrates a lot of commissioners is a lack of study and preparation. It's very important to be prepared. Uh, when preparing, candidates need to glean any and all correspondence received by commissioners and sealers. If you need to, ask your deputy or your commissioner for information so you can keep current on our issues. Um, uh, preparation, there may not be as much training from the state as there was in the old days, but KSAP and these upcoming webinars will be invaluable to you to help assist you for future success. Uh, it was noticed that KSAP candidates generally train better because they had more practice. Uh, it's recommended that you interview your deputy or commissioner as part of your preparation for every exam. If you work exclusively in one program or testing another, Ask your manager or boss for some time to work in the area that you want to get more experience in. Now, with these questions and presentations, this was from all the people that replied. Every one of them said the same thing. Please say your name when giving a presentation. Don't, and don't pigeonhole yourself into a county where you currently work. Remember, these are statewide exams. When you're doing a presentation, uh, Remember to introduce yourself, use good hand gestures, and smile. Try to make the best impression that you can, and remember to ask for questions. Those who kept these presentations simple and direct seem to do the best. Uh, on the negative side of your presentation, try not to hold on to the lectern like you're going to be falling off of a boat. Uh, they forgot to introduce themselves and ask for questions at, at the conclusion. It helps to type the title of the position that you're seeking and, and which county you work with in a presentation. And this is very important. Don't leave the podium until you've asked your questions and the panel says that, that we have no further questions. Very important. Uh, with regards to stakeholders, uh, as a deputy, don't forget to include discussing with your commissioner or sealer or at least consulting with them as, if available. Because as a deputy, your boss is your stakeholder, one of your key ones. Several candidates also had a weakness when it comes to local, local stakeholders, such as their county administration and their board of supervisors, whether it's related to ordinance authorities, keeping them informed, or if there's role as an authority, an appointing authority. Try to speak so everyone can hear you when you're making prep, uh, presentations. And try to remember, again, it's a state perspective and not, it's not an all me answer to the question. You want to make sure you're talking about your relationship as part of the team when you're answering the question. You work for your boss and that's supposed to be part of the team and that should be part of your answer. And remember that regular updates are part of a mandatory and respected part of keeping your position and that's something that should be stated when you're doing your presentations or 
answer your questions. Quite a few attendants speak about their tanning experience with programs, but they that may not be relevant to answer. Again, they suggest keeping the state perspective. And then here's a few things for ending our growth. Regardless whether you pass or fail these exams, please ask for feedback once the exam process is over. This is important for professional development and will help you further towards passing in the future exam. Uh, we want to encourage you to use your time at the end of the questions to go back and cover anything that may or may not be, that you may have left out in an answer. And uh, again, the most important thing is to understand when you're at these interviews that the panel really wants you to be successful. Okay. So, in, in summary, next slide, please. There we go. In preparation, practice public speaking. Let's see, it goes without saying. The more you practice, whether it's Toastmasters or anything else, you get more comfortable with dealing with uh, points of view or perspectives that you're asked to share. And we encourage you to practice with your peers, with your family, whoever you need to, so that you're comfortable to uh, talk to the public. Career development versus cram cramming. With so many responsibilities, commissioner, seals, and deputies, that it's impossible to prefer for these license exams by just cramming over a short period of time. Relevant topics and issues could be studied before exams, but most of this examination is really based on your career development, how much time you invest to learning about all the things that you need to know. And like it was stated by both Gary earlier and also by the commissioner's comments, you need to get out of your comfort zone and try to work with other people in different programs if you need to learn other things. Ask for these assignments. Try to get uh, new job assignments if it could help you, if you're allowed to do that. But by understanding the knowledge of other disciplines, this will really help you in the long term. Try to stay current. Be sure to stay up on the current events affecting agriculture and wages measures on the statewide level as they often will show up in exam questions. This could include news items, disaster events, legislation, and regulation changes. Try to get the big picture. Keep in mind you are testing for a statewide license, so be prepared for topics that may, may not necessarily be going on or affect your county. And also, know the why. When studying for a topic, try not to only learn the what, how, and when, but also the background behind the issue. Why is this policy in place? Why is there a need for this program? Why are we trying to exclude these certain pests from the state, et cetera, and et cetera? So with that, we'll go back to Gary now. Thanks, Julie. So in this portion of the presentation, we're just going to kind of go through some of the things, and these are very general topics that show up again and again on these exams, and then we'll go to our website and kind of show you where our, our current reading or study list is. So I'm just going to go through these very quickly. Um, things that can always show up, you should know the mission statement and organization of CDFA and DPR. You should know the county relationship to state programs. So wherever there's a nexus between the county contracting with the state or, or working in a state program, you should be fairly familiar with that program. Uh, you should know why these programs exist and what would happen if they, they weren't there. Uh, you should be familiar with CACASA, why, why does it exist and, and what are its standing committees and, and program committees. This is a very important one. You should know who your stakeholders are. And by stakeholders we mean not only industry and public, but your boss, that might be your commissioner or sealer, it might be your board of supervisors. Um, could be uh, also trying to blank here, but <laughs> the state programs you're working with. That's there, 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 there. that's us. <laughs> um, authorities, as Joey said earlier, you should know the difference between a law and a regulation and an ordinance, and, and you should know how those all interact with each other. Um, you should be at least vaguely familiar with the legislature and regulatory processes. You know, how does a bill become a law? How does a, a regulation get started from an idea or, or a need and, and put into the 
Code of Regulations. You should know your authorities. Um, you should be very familiar with the authorities that pertain to agricultural commissioners in the Food and Ag Code and the Business and Profession Code, or SEALERS. Um, you should know about the NIST handbooks or uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology handbooks and how do guidelines get into those and how do they get changed. You should also be very familiar with your authority to enforce those national guidelines and how the business and profession codes and the code of regulation gives uh, inspectors in California authority to enforce those regulations as well. Uh, you should be very familiar with the fine and civil penalty process, and that goes for any of the four exams that that question creeps up again and again. This is the big one you should know. It does not work like this. <laughs> oh, where does the money that supports your programs come from, and what does it get used for? You should be familiar with the unclaimed gas tax. Um, how that process works and how that money gets distributed to counties. Um, on the DPR side, of course, you should be familiar with the pesticide mill fees and similar how it gets distributed to counties. Um, you should be familiar with uh, federal grants and general fund within in the county system. Uh, state general fund dollars and, and contracts that we contract uh, with you and how that money gets there. And any fees for or special funds that may be collected by the county or the state, you should be familiar with. And then last of all is county general fund um, and state and county contracts. So anyway, you should be familiar with all those funding mechanisms, how they work, um, what your role might be in, in budgeting or, or contracting with the state for the different positions you're, you're applying for. And that's obviously different if you're a deputy as opposed to a commissioner or a senior. And this next one is uh, your roles in carrying out state programs. Um, what are some of the investigatory techniques that uh, might be required? And that's at the, at the deputy or level or commissioner level, that's going to be more directing staff to do those investigations. What do you need to do? And as I just said, budgeting. You know, what do you need to do? And the question that comes up again and again is you need to start in some sort of new program. Um, one of the things a lot of people leave out is the um, financial component of that. We need to make sure that we have the money to do that. Uh, personnel management, you, know, you need to be familiar with you know, selecting staff, uh, assigning them to appropriate positions, and even uh, disciplining staff if necessary. And it brings up one point on these exams. A lot of time I'm asked, you know, how much detail do you want as far as uh, disciplinary actions? And, Really, on our exams, we're not concerned with the whole Skelly process, and they have the right of appeal and that. Um, pretty much, if it comes to a disciplinary uh, question, just saying I work with my HR to take appropriate disciplinary action appropriate to our county is, is fine, because it varies somewhat from county to county. Uh, communication, and this goes back to stakeholders. Who do you need to communicate with, and, and how do you communicate with them? Um, do you communicate via um, electronic messaging, radio, newspaper ads, um, town hall meetings, public meetings, industry meetings, those, those sort of things. Um, board presentations is another one. Um, and this kind of goes with budgeting, but obtaining resources and allocations. So, you know, every program needs to have resources, you need to have staff, you need to have equipment, you need to have facilities, and that goes hand in hand obviously with the budgeting. And then planning, obviously, you know, how do you implement a program um, from start to finish? You know, if you were asked to get a program off the ground, what do you need to do and then how do you can or plan for its continued success? And, Uh, problem solving, you know, a lot of our questions have to do with uh, can a candidate get from point A to point B in a logical um, fashion. So all those being said, um, 
And we did this last uh, last exam cycle, and uh, that is we we posted a fairly extensive study list on our website. And I'll just take a couple seconds to show you where that's at. But if, if you go to cdfa.ca.gov, um, go up here and click under divisions, and then go down here to the county relations office. And under there's a lot of information here. A lot of people aren't aware of this site even because it's kind of obscure to get there. But remember, it's under divisions and then county relations office. There's information on how to get to the notification system, um, recent appeals that we've had, uh, calendars for CACASA meetings, um, how to get in touch with county staff and CDFA staff. But the one I want to focus on here today is uh, under licensing exams and study materials. And then the last one, and we'll update this each time before each exam cycle. Although the topics are fairly general, so I wouldn't expect it to change extensively each time. One of the things you should take note here, you know, at the top is the references below are intended to assist candidates in preparation for the oral portion of the exams. However, they don't contain all the information necessary to be successful in passing an exam i.e. simply memorizing and reciting the reference material is not going to be enough to get you a passing score. So what we're asking that you do is know this material and then apply it to the, the various scenarios that may be in one of the exams. <coughs> and in here, each of these blue areas, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, are hyperlinks to other sites that uh, contain the information. But, um, uh, a couple of these, um, CACASA fact sheet. Um, each year, CACASA representatives go back to Washington, D.C., and this is one of the fact sheets that they use to describe CACASA and its purpose to the, the federal legislatures back there. So that's a good reference. Um, one of the first places you should start looking is what is the CACASA mission and what are the um, bylaws and uh, the various uh, um, agreements that they have that can be found in their missions and bylaws. And then uh, CACASA.org, I believe a lot of the area groups are now posting their minutes from their various area group min or, uh, meetings there. So those are always good resources that can be found in that board. Um, duties and responsibilities, again, as I said earlier, you should go to the Food and Ag Code and, and know what the duties and responsibilities are of uh, commissioners, sewers, and, and their staffs. Um, agreement for attaining mutual objectives. This is an important one. Um, it's basically the guidelines by which uh, CACASA, CDFA, and CDL, DPR are going to uh, operate. And as I understood earlier, you know, here's good links on how a bill becomes a law and the rulemaking process. Uh, CDFA division links, if you click there, that will take you and show you all the divisions of CDFA and how we're organized. Um, these are sections of the Food and Ag Code that have to do with the gas tax. Um, you should be very familiar with that. Um, county requirements to submit annual financial statements, that can be found there. You should at least vaguely be familiar with CEQA and NEPA and how those acts um, impact um, county programs. And that applies to both the CDFA side and the, uh, and the uh, DPR side. Um, frequently, we'll, we'll ask uh, questions about recent legislation or legislation that's of uh, great significance. It's currently in the, in the cycle. So um, you should be aware of those. I've been posting all of my uh, monthly reports to the commissioners online, and in those usually it has all the big bills that uh, apply to food and ag and uh, the commissioners in those, and so you can go through and find the numbers. If you go to leginfo.ca.gov, you can search any of those and get the details of what they are for. Um, you should know the county role in cooperative programs like trapping and, and uh, farmers markets, things like that. 
Um, on the weights and measures side, um, there's a NIST handbook, actually 155, that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but it basically tells states how to set up weights and measures programs and gives uh, suggestions. It's always a good reference. Um, the various handbooks, of course, are available on the NIST homepage. Um, weights and measures penalty guidelines for civil uh, penalties are can be found uh, at that link. Uh, National Conference Weights and Measures, they have very good information on how the NIST handbooks uh, get changed there. Um, authorities to enforce the NIST handbooks can be found at, at those two links there in the Business and Professional Code and the Code of Regulation. And again, these were some uh, bills that were of recent importance that are, are either have gone through or um, are going through the legislative process currently. And then uh, DPR, sorry, not DPR, um, DMS has some um, very good uh, program manuals online on their website, and you can reach all those links by going here. And I don't know if Julie wanted to go into any more detail on any of these, but you can see all the uh, links for the various DPR topics are, are listed here, as well as their compendium. Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that book called A Guide to Pesticide Regulation in California. It's if you go chapter by chapter, it will give you a tremendous background and understanding of each of our programs, their purposes, and the roles of the programs and branches. It talks about a lot of the elements when it comes to registration, reevaluation, assessing risk, our partnerships with the counties, protecting workers in the, in, in the public, in the environment, risk assessment, risk management, funding. It's a really good concise digest of a lot of the materials that would help you prepare for our particular programs and in these exams. And also understanding the processes that are involved and the branches that work together to do some of these functional programs that we work collectively at DPR at, together with. Mm -hmm. Anyway, please use that study guide. We, as I said, we plan on updating it or, or maintaining it um, through each exam cycle. So. Um, use that. I, if you do that, I, I don't think you will be in for very many surprises on the exams anyway. All of our questions typically come off of those topics. Um, I know we're getting close to our hour here, but uh, we did want to go through just a couple more, more slides for you here to talk about some different question types that you might see on on exams, and uh, I'll let Joey do that for you. I won't take much longer. We talked about the oral presentation, and it was emphasized how important it was. We were, when you do an oral presentation in these particular exams, it's real important to assume that the audience has no uh, knowledge of that particular topic. It's important that you give a beginning, a middle, and an end to explain what your uh, presentation is all about, uh, put it in perspective, and summarize it. Uh, you, when you're making that presentation, you're assuming the role of the, of the position you're interviewing for. Or So if you're going to be a commissioner, you want to talk as your commissioner or the deputy or the sealer. And also, very importantly, please introduce yourself and ask for questions and wait until you're dismissed from the panel. The next type of question is what we call rote knowledge or memor memor memorized knowledge. If you notice, a lot of these are process-oriented process types of examples, such as civil penalty process, legislation, rulemaking, recent legislation, policy changes or regulations, a mill fee process, unclaimed gas tax. It also can include how weights and measures, how you want to move an audience through CACASA and the Weights and Measures Conference. It can include a continuous evaluation of DPR, what the processes are. These kinds of things where you should understand from beginning to end what the process is. So if you're asked this type of question, you have this rote knowledge able to present to us. This third question, type of question is a scenario question. We've uh, developed a little term, uh, it's like an anagram called spiral. And what spiral stands for is that what we wanted you to do is be able to see if something happened, how would you respond? So 
what you're going to be doing is demonstrating to us your knowledge and judgment of how to handle a specific situation. And what we wanted to do at the spiral was basically these are the things that are involved. Who are my stakeholders? How am I going to put out the fire? What are my immediate actions going to be? What are the impacts if I don't do anything? What are the impacts once I do do something? What resources are available to me? Who do I need? Uh, uh, what kind of funding do I have right now? Do I have to acquire funding? Do I have to request some additional funding? Am I going to get, if it's a bill, am I going to be getting more money? Do I have to print contracts? All kinds of things with this particular one. And then what authorities do I have? Do we have to create some type of ordinance in my community to complement what's being done? Is it a regulation that's requiring me to do something? Or is it spelled out very clearly now and then I need to move forward and let my board know? Um, what is the chance for my long-term solution or success? That's where the L comes from. What are the results and what am I trying to obtain? And whenever you do these questions, the most important thing you can do when you have this thing is to remember that I want to evaluate as I'm going through these processes and see whether or not I'm being successful and tweaking it so I come back and, and reevaluate and assessing what's going on until we get it right. It's always important to remember that part when you're doing a spiral type scenario, it's assessing how well it's going through time. The last question that's not on here, they haven't had it in the last time or two, but that doesn't mean it won't be offered or, or available, is a cold question. And sometimes these questions are included in the interviews to see how well you respond to unexpected situations that may occur. Anything else, Gary? Uh, I just wanted to add on the on the spiral thing. That's something I kind of came up with. That I found that acronym, and then you might come up with one that works better for you. Um, but you know, there's only six letter of word I could come up with that had all these in it. But it helped me during my preparation time. We go through very similar exams here at the state, and it helped me during my 30 minutes of prep time if I just went in and wrote down the letters for spiral, and then started listing out. Uh, an outline to make sure I addressed each of those uh, six letters there. And it really helped me develop uh, more uh, rounded answers, I guess, to make sure I wasn't leaving anything out. So with that, our contact information is here. And uh, I think, Josh, I don't know if we have time, or we're more than willing to answer some questions if anybody has any. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to reiterate a couple of things that were said, and then I know we're uh, up at our hour, but I don't mind sticking around for a little bit and answering questions if people would like, and uh, I don't know about you guys, but sure, no, we're fine. Just, just to reiterate, the panel wants you to succeed. This is not the bad old days. You've heard the bad stories about the panel picking favorites, and if they didn't like you, you weren't going to pass your success is completely up to you. If you know the information and you answer the questions correctly, you will pass. Uh, it's as simple as know the information, pass the exam. Um, just to reiterate, answer the question for the position you are testing for. Um, as a deputy, you're thinking about who's gonna pay for it, who's going to do the work, how you're going to pay for it, who you're going to assign to do the work, who you need to tell about it, including your commissioner or your sealer, uh, for instance. Um, ask for feedback. Ask for feedback from Gary and Joey after the exam, even if you pass the exam. I think it's a good relationship builder. And also, um, you know, especially if you don't pass, don't let it be a mystery why you didn't pass. Uh, lastly, to the extent that your uh, managers and supervisors will give you the time, try to attend. If you're a deputy already, try to attend a commissioner area group or one of the annual conferences. Um, if you're an inspector, try to attend a deputy meeting, at least one before the uh, exam, just because it gives you a perspective. When you hear the conversations going on at those meetings, it will give you a better perspective of what the level and the uh, type of language that's used by the people at the deputy or commissioner sealer level. So, well, I wanna be respectful of everybody's time and um, 
Gary and Joey, if you don't have their email, um, it's in this PowerPoint presentation, which I'll make sure is available. As I mentioned, we've also recorded this, and so um, if you have other questions, please get in touch with myself or Gary or Joey directly if you have other questions, and we'll be looking forward to the next exam with, or the next exam prep webinar. Webinar. I have everybody's email that participated, so you will be directly notified of when to um, sign up and how to do that. So thanks again, and with that, I am going to uh, end this webinar. Thank you very much.